Okay, guys, um, welcome back to BJJ 101 Storeroom Podcast. This is episode 19, and we have our awesome sound guy guest, Tim Serrell. So, Tim, it's always um, um, fun to hang out and chat and everything like that, and it's cool to have you on to do, like, a formal podcast. We always start with, like, well, I always start with, um, like, a very generic, basic question that I try to ask everyone, and I just try to get everyone to talk about like an introduction of themselves they introduce their childhood their upbringing whatever stuff you want to mention about that and then also you know what you do for work and all this type Mm -hmm. of thing now but also where you were introduced to martial arts kind of along the way all right well first of all thanks thank you for having me on this is strange to be on this side of things i'm usually back there crawling on the floor or (laughs) you know like to avoid it being in shot or um doing a ninja mode over there yeah Don't look at me. I'm yeah. Um, but it's interesting. Thanks for having me on on this side of it. Um, so yeah, my name is Tim. Um, start from the beginning. I don't know. I grew up in Mount Nebo. Yeah. Uh, a, a house my parents built. I don't know if anyone knows where Mount Nebo is. It's um. I don't know. Outside, like the there's like Ash Grove and the Gap here. Okay. I guess it's like Mount Nebo Road is like what, half an hour, so it's out in the bush yeah. essentially. Cool. So I grew up in the bush yeah. uh, until I was eight years old. Okay. Like my primary school had like sixty kids. Mm-hmm. It's a very hippie based place. Like I went to school with kids like called like Peach and okay. Willow and stuff. Yeah, uh, we were actually quite probably the most conservative family there, I'd say. Yeah. And then. Um, we had chickens and like two basketball yeah, yeah. hoops. So it was, it was like at the at the school they had that kind of stuff, like a kind of agricultural stuff. Or? Yeah, the school actually didn't have quite a lot back then. It was pretty basic, to be okay. honest. It was just a normal primary school. It just had, it wasn't like a hippie school. It was actually quite. Um, but at home you had chickens and horses. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No horses, but we had um, we had chickens yeah. and. Yeah, I had two basketball hoops. I had a ten foot, a regular one, and oh, then I had wow. a dunking hoop as well. Nice. So it was actually pretty, yeah. Training for the NBA one day. Pretty huh? much. <laughs> well, I had a false sense of uh, what I could do with basketball for sure. <laughs> was dunking on people. Mm. Um, but so Mount Nebo was good to grow up in. Um, I didn't learn how to ride a bike until I was a lot older because it was too hilly, yeah. to give you an idea. And then um, it just got too hard for my family having to commute okay. so much. Were they working in Brisbane? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My mum was working in the city and my dad was all around, so... We, we've then ended up moving to the Gap yep. suburb, uh, in the suburbs when I was eight and I was suburban kid from then on, really. Okay, okay. Um, growing up, I've played a lot of sports. Played not a lot, but I played sports. I played, grew up playing a lot of soccer. Yep. Actually played baseball for about seven years. Oh, wow. I started doing t-ball for the first couple yep. um, when I was really young. You know, like, like the junior kids here, yeah, like yeah. that age. And then up until high school, I played baseball. Like I was like a pitcher, <coughs> really enjoyed doing that. Really liked team sports. Was that like a fairly big competition or not really within Australia? I don't know about Australia, but there was, the baseball scene was actually, Pretty. it was like something like we would, um, it was the Windsor Royals. So like Holloway Field, I'm sure you, you've probably driven past it without yeah. knowing where the bandits play. Okay. Um, and then I, I played at Dorrington Park in Ashgrove. I went back and forth. But yeah. um, it's like any subculture. You, you go into it and you realise a lot of people do it. Yeah, yeah. I think Jimmy, who trains here, yeah. um, he used to play for the Royals. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it was, yeah, so a lot of kids played it. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, for a very short period of time, was actually pretty good at pitching. Like I was actually oh, yeah. striking dudes and like choosing what type of pitch to do and stuff. Yeah, curveball. Yeah, uh, more like sliders where you like, it What's like comes in from the top left hand corner and goes to the bottom down. right. Oh, wow. And it's actually, Very if they technical. swing, if they swing and miss, it's a ball. Like, mm. so you shouldn't swing. Yeah, mm. shouldn't actually swing at those. So baseball was fun. Um, a lot of American dads were our coaches. So okay. like um, learning how to sledge and talk crap to people <laughs> was encouraged, <laughs> which no. all the Aussie dads are like, can't do that. You can't do so that. And it's like, don't listen to him, man. We got, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Tell him he's terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but um, I guess music is a big, big part of my life. So yeah. I grew up playing like classically trained on piano. And then 
So when did you start doing that? When was the music? Because we like uh, the people at the gym. If they're not aware, we know that you you know played in bands and music yeah. and and done a lot of music stuff. When did you start to like get introduced to the music side of things? Well, from from as early as I can remember, I learned piano, and okay. I I actually hated it growing up. Okay. Like, you know, you like, oh, it's um, it's annoying to like uh, not. It's like hard, and then your parents like keep with it, and you're yeah. like, it's not fun, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And my parents were always like, no, no, stick with it. And I'm glad they did because um, I guess it just wasn't the instrument for me because when I was about 11 or 12, I picked up the bass guitar, electric bass. Yeah. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, was um, just like changed my life essentially. Mm-hmm. It was a changed how I, like, I became so obsessed that I stopped doing sport. I was like interested in skateboarding, but I, I didn't even start really. All my friends are skateboarding and I got obsessed with, yeah, electric, yeah. with electric bass. So that was from, you know, 11 and a half, 12. Oh, wow. um, and that was like, like I, uh, my brother played it, I used his bass and then I got so obsessed that I got my own. And that was um, hours a day. That was like. Well, what, what do you reckon the reason for that was? Is there something that you saw or you just saw it rock and roll was cool? Like <sighs> probably, what? probably a bunch <laughs> of stuff. Like uh, I was lucky. I mean, my brother's six years older than me, so okay. he had a really good CD collection. Yeah. And so... It was like Limp Bizkit came out, Corn, Rage Against the Machine, yeah. and, and Green Day and stuff. So I mean, just playing along and re- that kind of music was accessible. Yeah. It was like, oh, I could actually do this. Mm-hmm. And then like Red Hot Chili Peppers and all that kind of stuff. And I think it was maybe a year in realizing that I got the next level of ability in it, and was like, I could do this. Yeah, like, yeah. And um, I just got super obsessed. I was always obsessed with things growing up, and I'd, I'd get really fixated on stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I would say for from age twelve to eighteen, it was like it was like five hours a day on bass. Wow. Okay. At, at least I remember crying because I got <laughs> sick and I hurt my hand or something and I couldn't play. Yeah. So I was really, really into it, and um, that kind of kept me out of trouble in high school. I'd say because okay. it's like um, you had something to put your energy and stuff into. Yeah. Yeah, like probably, man. I remember growing up and like the guys and the and the girls and the people that had like some outlet or something to focus on, whether it's sport or mm-hmm. dance or you know, which is another sport or performance type thing. They weren't getting in as much trouble. Mm. Uh, we've talked about this before on the podcast too about kids and boys and girls and whatever, especially on that teenage age, like you're talking about, yeah. which is like a really, um, it's a very like uh, what do you call it, like a turmoilic time where you don't know what you're doing you're making crazy decisions yeah you're starting to have some independence and like your own decision making and like there's a lot of you can you know stick to this stuff and play sports and do competition things or performance or you're going to go out and hang out with friends and drink and break into a car or whatever yeah like idle hands (laughs) yeah you're gonna get creative on bad things to do Yeah. yeah as opposed to yeah, keeping busy and doing something constructive. Yeah. I mean, and I think, like, skateboarding and stuff is, is good to do. Yeah, um, anything, anything, it builds anything that, help me, man. Especially if you're, like, <clears throat> trying to, like, kickflip down and downstairs and, you like, you, like, crash and hurt yourself 50 times and then finally get it. It's like that not giving up. Yeah. But, um, but you can also, there's only so many hours in a day and I think I, I put all my eggs in the music basket, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it was... You know, I, I learned a lot from it and I got a lot of joy from it. Um, had bands in high school. Um, so I did electric bass. So I also did double bass, like upright. Okay. So I got into jazz and stuff like that. Pretty, oh, wow. pretty heavy, yeah. Doing so everything, doing all the genres. Yeah, yeah. Like I did classical, <laughs> but um, I got into jazz pretty early. And um, How old were you? So how old, like what's the timeline for this so you got the bass or whatever like 11 12 yeah you so five hours a day yeah when did you start doing like school or like garage bands and stuff like that garage bands was when i was 14 turning 15 okay cool actually had a band that we we did pretty well in the high school we did like high school rock competition yeah, yeah, yeah. so i won i actually got best bass player for a couple of those competitions and won like an amplifier and stuff oh wow cool. only because the other guys were like you know doom 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 like in like punk bands mm. and i was like bigger 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 bam 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 you yeah, know yeah, like yeah. so i was like by default because i was showing off a little bit yeah. i would get like yeah but that was that was encouraging i was like oh yeah you know people are enjoying the music um we got like third in high school rock nice 
look, and these are all, you know, that's like, yeah. at, as at that time, that was like. It was a big deal at the time. Well, it was something we kind of made out of nothing and it, mm. um, you know, it was rewarding. Um, yeah, so 15, doing that kind of stuff. And I played in, 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 a, in a band in, well, through high school. Yeah. Um, but I also got involved around a year, year 11. I was involved in the um, Young Conservatorium. So that was kind of for like teenagers who like, I don't know, potentially, you know, like a, maybe a higher level than high school and wanted to like perform at like an adult level. With, with, if with music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after school I would go to the Conservatorium of Music and um, play in, their, in like a big band of other okay. high school kids. Yeah, yeah. Almost like... Um, how would you compare it here? Like it's just like an extra training program, like yeah. But also like teenage blue belts who are training with adults, adults I guess, and so, they're, yeah. they're encouraged. It's like they come to the open mat. Yeah, you, adults, you're so. you've got an ability. This is like um, let's expose you to more of an adult yeah. part of it, and and you're kind a of more serious yeah. area of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember uh, we talked about you playing the nightclubs, and mm. you were under eighteen. Yeah. And I asked you if you needed to have like the um, your parents with you to play in those. You yeah, have a funny story that you told me after after playing, you had to call your parents to pick you up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was I was very lucky. My parents drove me around because I was very supportive of the music. Yeah, yeah. Especially good man. Especially working because yeah. like. Uh, Played a lot of jazz gigs, like where I'd wear a suit, like I'd play a winery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and like I'd have stuff. an ampli. My parents had a station wagon, so I'd have an amplifier, this double bass, Huge. and then a box of leads and stuff, mm. and a trolley and stuff. And so I couldn't drive yet, so my parents would, yeah, they'd drive me to the gig. So with the jazz group, is this like with adults and stuff as well, or is it a juniors? Like- I actually met other like-minded people in the young conservatorium. Oh, cool, so man. we were all like in grade 11 and 12. And that was part of our appeal of getting booked. It was yeah. like, oh, we've got these kids, but they're playing jazz tunes and oh, stuff. Cool, and yeah, so I'd play clubs in rock bands, but in jazz as well. And um, yeah, my parents would drive me and they'd go, go in the back door and go to the stage. And then I'd have to go from the stage to the back door. And like, oh, okay, okay. And like um, couldn't even walk, couldn't even like, I guess I did go to the bathroom, but you know, it's like you have to have permission and stuff like that. And yeah, yeah, I ring my, I'm, I'm finished now. Mom. <laughs> and they pick me up from the valley or something, and like people are punching the window and stuff as my mum's reversing out of the, out of a side alley in the valley. Really? That's, yeah. that's like, geez. You know, you know, because it's yeah. like drunks and they don't know I'm some kid, and it's like yeah. my mum picking me up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have stories like that. I remember playing rugby in, in, in Adelaide, like on like the prem grade side, same type of thing you're talking about, like, um, playing A grade stuff when I was like 16 or whatever. Yeah. And it was like raining or whatever. My mum just turned up and went to the coach and said, no, he's got to go now. Like I'm in the middle of a game and she's just like, no, nah, like I've had enough. I'm not staying here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> get him off, get him off. <laughs> oh, Anton, your mum's saying you have to go. And I'm like, man, there's like, tw- like 20 guys, like adult guys that are like laughing and yeah, shit. Yeah, it's like, totally, hey. funny as hell, man. It's like... I had enough. No, 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 let's go. I've got to go pick up your brother or whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's this just doesn't fit my time on. Yeah. Yeah, but it's funny. Yeah, no, well, it's, um, we were at Mercy at that time to the parents' timeline, hey? Yeah. It's, um, it's like feeling an idea of what it's like to be independent, but, um. No, but they're also the ones that are being super supportive and taking you there. Yeah. And oh, yeah. So everything. thankful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, same, same for me. W- were you guys, like, earning money and stuff doing, like, so you were, yeah. you were earning, like, decent money now? Like, yeah, yeah. Stuff? So it was like, I mean, we probably ripped off at times. Yeah. Um, you get a couple hundred bucks or whatever. Yeah, some of the gigs were like a couple of hundred and then some of the gigs like 400 mm. per person. Oh, really? oh, per person? Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome, man. Cash. Getting cash money. <laughs> what, what, were you, what were you spending that on at 18 and stuff? Taking girls to lunch and Yeah, probably something. Yeah. Or probably like bass strings or, uh, or yeah, all more the, gear. All the, yeah, yeah, more gear. But yeah, it's always expensive, whatever the hobby it is. Oh, man, well, I ended up years later culling my equipment because it ended up owning me you're like you end up being a hoarder yeah, yeah. ends up when you move house you're like two people you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah you need a storage shed for your hobby yeah 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 no it's um crazy yeah so all through high school and then um then i ended up studying i went to i studied the conservatorium of music i did um music technology the bachelor of music technology so that's just like a music degree majoring in music technology um 
and I was pretty young. I was 19 when I finished that. Oh, wow. Like, I don't know how that worked out, but um, like I was probably turning 20 that year. Yeah. But um, so I did that. Um, you finished high school at 17 or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Super, I felt at that stage, music was the only thing I really knew about. I felt like when you look back on it, I was on autopilot as a person. I yeah. feel like when I look back at I didn't make any bad decisions, but you look back and it's, you don't really have, even have a personality. Like, like I was just like music, like. Yeah, but man, that's what, <laughs> like, I, 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 I don't think that's uncommon, man. I don't think that's bad. wrong or bad either. I think it's like very normal. Like, man, you just go toward like the, the path of least resistance. It's normal, yeah. man. It's the kind of normal. Well, it was. Man, I have the same thing. Like most people have the same thing. Like, of course there's like different, like, landmark key points of life and turning points and stuff like that. Mm. But you just generally move through life and it's kind of like that. It was my way of communicating. It was something I liked doing. I met a lot of interesting people through it. All my friends were. Yeah. Musicians. <laughs> yeah. Well. And uni I actually found uh, really disappointing because I – it was actually a lesson in having expectations because I yeah. was like, oh, it's going to be awesome. Everyone's going to like be like, what did you make today? What music are you into? Yeah. And a lot of them were massive nerds, and I don't mean like good nerds. I mean like Gibbons, like yeah. who were like, I don't really listen to music. Hey, I just blah blah blah. Like, I thought it'd be kind of cool to do, and I'm like, oh, like I was. They weren't real passionate about it, like you. No, were. there was one other guy who ends up. He's actually a world famous DJ now, and he yeah. was. He had like a really nice car. He was. He was getting a lot of money DJing yeah. around the same age as me. I was actually. Dude, I did the start. I did the wrong thing. What am I? Oh, I should have well, been, been a DJ. I should have been a strip club DJ. What is going on? He had like yeah. a Toronto. He had this nice car. He's like, nice car. He's like, yeah, it's my second one. I'm like, second one. Yeah. Like I don't even, mm. I don't even have one yet. So he was doing, yeah. But the rest of them are just. I actually, f through the years of uni, I was quite a bit disillusioned. I I missed my jaded teenage years, and that actually, I was actually a bit of a late bloomer. I started to get very disillusioned at that time yeah. and jaded, yeah. um, which is kind of sad in a sense. But having said that, I actually got into, like, I did music technology, but I was able to still get the jazz gigs that all the other guys studying bass was, were doing. So yeah. it was good. I had, like, two lives there. Um, and then I got really heavy into beat making and electronic production. Yeah. And that was around the time of, like, MySpace. Yeah. So, like, the beginning of social media and MySpace. Yeah. And I went really intense on MySpace for a few years. I like would DM the equivalent of direct messaging like rappers in America. Yeah. Um, like I'd, I'd like DM a hundred a day. Selling beats. Selling stuff. beats. And then I somehow got uh, involved in the scene in Atlanta in Georgia yeah. through a friend I studied who moved back to Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Yeah. And I got like a, a connect with him. And then I was just selling beats outright online on MySpace mm. and um, to a bunch of different rappers in Atlanta. I was like, for like, I don't think like between $400 and $500 a beat, but then yeah. like they, they owned it. So yeah. I'd do that on PayPal. Yeah. So I was hustling beats for a little bit of time. That's a There's, big thing now too, like all the production stuff. Of, yeah. But like it's, I think maybe the rules have changed now or whatever, but like a lot of the producers that produce these, beats and stuff they own the rights to the song half the rights to the song and stuff yeah <clears> well you pay you, royalties and stuff you now. take a risk because you go to an unknown guy and you go i should have i should have charged more but i was young mm. so you do like four hundred dollars cash but mm. now you own it mm. and so it could go nowhere and mm. you've cool i made four hundred five hundred five hundred dollars or they go cool like i only i spent that much but then it could blow up. Yeah. What are the odds? I mean, none of them really blew up. I got radio play with a bunch of them. Some of them toured on the songs, but so yeah, you can get stuffed on, um, screwed over when it comes to like publishing and stuff yeah. like that. But that's where you need to know. Know the rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I want f I want this much up front, and then I want this percent of mechanical royalty versus publishing and that kind of stuff. Mechanical being the uh, the physical recording. Yeah. And then publishing being the songwriting intellectual property. Like um, like um, if someone covers my song yeah. um, or d r releases sheet music or someone doesn't, know. you know, like um, like the, the piano book. Yeah. Um, you get money off the, the idea of the song, the, the actual song itself. Yeah. So there's all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, 
and you take a risk with that stuff. Some people get screwed over. Some people make the right choice and yeah. get a lot of money. So yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting, though. yeah, I don't know. So I did that, and um, I really enjoyed that. But look, that was there's no um, that was a short period that I did that. It's like I can't like do this forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how how long were you old at that time? Nineteen twenty. Yeah, nineteen twenty. I moved to Melbourne for a little bit straight after um, finishing at the conservatorium. yeah cons conservatorium, and um, that was pretty interesting. Um, I got involved in the, like. The, the like the street art um, scene there, like uh, sten stencils. Oh yeah. So Good. that was inter that was a bit spray, it was a bit sketchy a sketchy period of time. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, and then I actually came back to Brisbane, like my tail between my legs, being like, okay, I probably should um live a normal life. Like it wasn't that bad, but it was like it was there was no longevity in the life that I was living there. Why just, just partying and stuff. Yeah, and like, just the people I was surrounded with weren't going Ooh. anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lot of degeneracy and um. Just hipsters, just yeah. nothing to a lot of like vapid people. I was like, this is not, not fun. Um, uh, and I, I wasn't getting gigs down there or anything like that. So yeah. I came back up, but yeah, so early twenties. And then I, for year, I would say maybe three years, I was freelance producer full time. Yeah. So I was producing bands. Um, I lived in a studio in Cooperu on the train tracks yeah. on Temple street, super sketchy area. Yeah. Um, How was that though? How was that being like a producer and making people's music and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, it was good. It was good. There was, um, you know, it was interesting. Um, the only reason I lived in this place is because it was a studio. It used yeah. to be an old fish and chip shop. Um, I wouldn't have lived there normally because it was yeah. actually really scary. Yeah. <laughs> There's <laughs> a lot of transients, people like syringes being thrown on our, our roof and stuff like that. Yeah. Like it was a big drug area. Yeah. Um, but it was great. I mean, it was good. Um, Producing albums, producing singles for people. Um, it was tricky because it's like you'd get a good payday with something, but then like you don't have any work for a while. Yeah, you've got to. You don't get paid till it's done, and then like you got to chase the next thing so it lines up straight away. Yeah. So there's a lot of like, how am I going to pay rent? Yeah. Um, or there was like, oh, I got five grand, and then I'd like blow it all, blow it all on stupid stuff and then I'd be like buy some samurai oh, swords buy a samurai sword <laughs> buy sneakers I was really into sneakers yeah, yeah. I'd press a new girlfriend like essentially doing all the stupid things but I mean they're important I to mean, do that's how you learn that's, that's you right learn. That's, it's fun how everybody learns you've got to do it to learn that's most right. people can't learn by someone else telling them same with jiu jitsu yeah. man same with everything sometimes you got to learn through experience and it seems by definition silly no i got to make the mistake myself mm -hmm. not learning by someone wiser than you but sometimes it's like no i want to know what it's like i want to know what it's like to um yeah they don't they, look if people are curious that's the, that's how they find things out that's, that's how they do it yeah so so that period was good i did find a bit of like emptiness when I was towards my mid twenties of like, okay. is this what I want to do forever? Yeah. <laughs> Am I actually that good enough? Um, I think I second guess myself confidence wise. A lot of things I didn't pull the trigger on opportunity, certain opportunities, you know, like I'd get headhunted by like A and R like artist and repertoire yeah. for record labels. And yeah. I don't think I was as prepared as I could have been. Um, You know, and you, you regret these things, but it's like... But you, so what do you mean? You you, you could have had an opportunity to work for some other company? Yeah, like or, like, or like um, have a better port... Like, you know, to show what my portfolio was and maybe was not confident enough to, like... to like um, Jump at the opportunity. Jump at it or be confident enough to, like, yeah. sell myself enough. And, look, there's no regrets. I mean, a bunch of the stuff I produced helped, um, helped certain bands and they got radio play and... Yeah. There was also a lot of lessons in like um, relying on certain people within deals and kind of getting pushed aside and sc not screwed, you know, like being used and stuff yeah. like that. And like it turned out the production I was doing was just so someone could um, learn, like, learn how to do and then take you're... the kind of thing that I was doing and then do it with someone more known. Yeah. And then, like, you know, you yeah. like. Just the way it goes. And Stealing ideas and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And I guess I got jaded with it. And um, Yeah, it's unfortunate to... Man, We I talked about this to do with Hickson the other day, actually. And um, 
uh, Eduardo and, and you and, and someone else was talking about like how Hickson had kind of like brought out his new book and stuff like that and mm-hmm. um, and how, you know, it's getting a lot of sales and all this stuff. And I was just talking about like it's good to see people that are like, you know, um, like the godfathers of whatever it is, like jiu-jitsu that are actually getting something back from from like all, all, all they've contributed to making this thing how big it is because like right now the guys that are making money and they've only been in the sport for you know a few years and they, they didn't build it up from the ground it was already here for them you know what i mean like there's so many different scenarios like that like man you've spent you know how many years getting good at um you know production and all this stuff and you're the one that come up with these ideas and then someone comes along takes it and then repackages it with someone else that's got a bit more um, notoriety and bang, oh, it explodes and stuff. And that's the same thing that's happening with, you know, a lot of big name guys fr- from the US or from Australia or whatever. Like, yeah, they're good at jujitsu and they're awesome and stuff. But like, man, the recognition that they're getting versus the people that founded this stuff is insane. And, and the monetary stuff that they're getting, mm. I think is crazy too. And in, in my opinion, I, f- I see it as a little unfair, but that's how the world is. The world is unfair. That, that's probably the is lesson, unfair. isn't it? That yeah. it's like, uh, it's a bit dog eat dog. It's kind yeah. of like, well, that's just the way it is. That's and the um, way of the world it is. And, you know, it's unfortunate for a lot of scenarios. It can cause a person to um, change, uh, the, like, how they approach situations and be a bit more cutthroat. Like, for I sure, found, for sure, yeah, I definitely went through my my uh, period where I was freaking goth, like, emo about everything. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And, like, I hate everybody, you yeah. know. But that's, um, you know, that's all right. That's you got to go through that as well. Yeah, you're going to be frustrated in lots of different situations. Yeah, yeah. And, but, I mean, it's also, like, the lesson from that as well, what are you going to do about it? I'm not going to cry. Like, yeah, yeah. you're not going to cry about it. You can't sit there and cry. you got to do something else, yeah. Yeah, because while you're sad, all your enemies are out da- there dancing, you know? Yeah. So, like... Get on with, with yeah. life. Yeah, you know, having argu- redoing arguments in your head that you've had and, like, what you would have <laughs> said. Like, that's so stupid, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when when BJJ comes into your life? Oh yeah, so okay, so so music, you know, was uh, yeah, a big part of my life, and I would say so. I'm 34. Yeah. When I was about 27, turning 27. So you were still doing the producing and stuff when you started doing jujitsu, or you stopped? Yeah, or? yeah. I and I st- I I actually have never stopped. Okay. Really, yeah. I just I came to terms with the fact that. I had to be all in yeah. to do it, to do it at a certain point. And I've had some, you know, had some great times, but I've I kind of accepted that like there's some other work, which I can get into that I, that I got into as a result, yeah. which kind of shaped um, my perspective on the world and that kind of stuff made me see the bigger picture. Yeah. But in terms of jujitsu, um, I just, I just one day decided like, I did karate growing up as well. Okay, I did okay. I did go kun ru. Yeah, which it might uh, be the same as what Petrus does. It might be. I, I can't remember. Well, I can't, I can't remember. Maybe. I have a feeling maybe not because this one was very um, for the kids. It was it was very uh, Carter based. Um, maybe he was saying that was the door knocking one. Right? Yeah, I think that's yeah. the one that's the like very. One you up for a year, you're going to be a black belt. Blah, 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 yeah, yeah. Each different. tick. Yeah. If you got enough ticks, then you grade. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I remember being disillusioned early on by the senseis there, like lack of leadership. Even kids can smell that. As a kid, you're like, <laughs> like, dude, no yeah. way. Like, this guy doesn't no. know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely can, man. That's amazing. They act a fool, yeah. They're That's just amazing. Nuts. They don't care. They're disrespectful. I think all people can sense that, man. If you don't actually bring any type of presence uh-huh. with like the way you instruct, teach, like you're saying, lead other human beings. People are gonna walk all over you, man. You can smell it pretty early on, um, or or it comes out eventually if, yeah, you, if you put up a front. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, um, I'd always been interested. I was a huge fan of the UFC for years, actually. I actually remember as a kid when I was um, on a holiday in Corumban. Yeah, I went to the video store and I saw there's like the naughty section and then there's like all the special interest area, yeah. somehow you'd end up there as a kid. And I... You would always go there as a kid. Yeah. It was a magnet for you. Yeah. Was, yeah. And um, I, I was really into WWF wrestling. Okay. And then I saw Ultimate Fighting Championship. Yeah. And it would have been like UFC 4 or something like that. And I remember looking at the back of it and the guy had blood all over his forehead. And I was like, 
That's I reckon that's actually real fighting. Like, because yeah. I remember, I loved Hulk Hogan, but you knew it was fake. Right, yeah. I was like, is that blood actually real? I remember feeling like an adrenaline rush looking at that, being like, that's actual fighting. Like, but then I didn't hear about it until, like, then 15 years passed or something. Yeah. Well, whatever the math is. And then I was always a fan of the UFC growing up. You'd hear about jiu- you'd hear about the jiu-jitsu guys and um, and then you'd go on, like, YouTube benders. And, you know, I remember seeing yeah. uh, bit, uh, Noguera versus uh, Frank, Frank Mir. Mir. Yeah, I remember, well, well yeah, the, the Kimura, but I just remember that transition and seeing the big guys, how it was, like, reversal and then the way that he would... He ended up on top. them on the bottom. Especially because so. he was losing on the feet and mm. like and like Nogueira was actually doing a right on the on the ground and yeah, until he reversed him and got the and he broke his shoulder and I remember that. I remember Floppy so, arm and Yeah, it was yeah. so I mean, stuff like that. Of course we'd all seen the um like the Hoist Gracie and stuff like that. Like versus like chemo and stuff. Yeah. So anyway anyway, I I wanted to from what I understood the the um sparring element was like giving you an idea of what it's actually like. Yeah, you get yeah. that feedback. So, look, I just Googled it and found the closest gym. Hey, luckily for the Google results, Gaha was in the right order yeah. or something. And um, yeah, they know how to put their search engine at the top for pretty DJ. Yeah, yeah, it's but it's funny how quick how stuff. things how things change because you see you see this guy on the website and that's Ed with his gear. Yeah. You don't know him and you're like, okay, this is a stranger. And then I think I even wussed out the first night. I think I drove here. Yeah. And it was the lights are off. I'm like, oh, they're closed. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> they're closed. Oh, they're yeah, yeah. oh I, I went. They were closed. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> and then I went again on another night. This is actually just up the road. I I started the yeah. maybe the last year that it was up the road, mm. and then I went and saw a class and, and then I think I did my first daytime with Anchor, when he was here. Yeah. And you know I had like, shorts with pockets and a long sleeve like metal shirt or something yeah. and um, got smashed and got the feel, got immediately got that feeling and immediately was like, I am never Maybe not doing this yeah. again. Yeah. Like I, I loved it. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was sweet. Like part trying to pass the guard and. You're just trying to figure out everything. It's so, I, I think like my, all, all people, particularly the all people that do jujitsu have like this um, problem solving, like urge, like they're, it's such a creative problem solving <laughs> like activity it's mm. and it's so live and it's so complex and it's so unusual and so uncommon and it's just so unintuitive in certain areas like it, it becomes like this puzzle you know mm-hmm. what i mean and i think a lot of creative people really get like they get that they scratch their creative itch doing this type of thing yeah because it's just so like to get good at jiu-jitsu you have to be creative to some extent because you've got to figure out how to learn mm. this crazy multifaceted discipline of you know you got to understand the anatomy of the body and all these mm. different concepts and principles and stuff and it's really interesting do you have any do you have any like things that you kind of like learn through music or whatever that you can compare with jiu-jitsu or, or that might have helped yeah so because right now you're you're a purple belt at this point how long have you been training at this point uh in terms of actual training yeah. time around just under six years, yeah. about six years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because there was, I've probably been here just about seven, but a lot of injuries, there was some there. issues with COVID with my work, which I, I was delayed a bit longer than everyone else was coming yeah. back. That's a whole other story. Mm. Um, so six years, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, mainly in terms of a skill set, it was, there are a lot of things I could apply. Like, for example, um, like with double bass. Yeah. There's hand positions, so yeah. there's, there's a basis of of, tec- of technique. Like, yeah. no one can get around. It has to be position. This position is how you do something. Play base, yeah. So with, with um, double base, there's no frets. Yeah. So everything you have to learn this, like create a new neural pathway through doing it and ta- the tactile feeling yeah. of it. <clears throat> and you reach a point where you know you plateau, but then you like break through this next level, and you it just becomes normal. But the only way to do it is to just do it over and over and over, and over again. Like I'd get to these scales and it's like, you know, blah, dah, dah. no, that's slightly a millimeter off. Okay. Dah, dah, dah. Okay, good. Dah, 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 dah. Okay, that, no, that's slightly a millimeter mm. off. Like for like six hours. You know, you're like yeah. for hours. Mm. 
and it hurts your fingers and all that stuff. But you're like, I don't care if it hurts. Like, I just want to make it right. Yeah. And it's that you have to be self-motivated, all that kind of stuff. That's so a, that's super interesting. Cause I've never heard that perspective. Cause you know, I mean, I don't have like a big music background, so or any type of, you know, musical kind of stuff. That's really interesting for me that's like exactly the same as you would drill with this technique yeah. or a guy doing judo would just mm -hmm. do the throw oh the foot's off boom do yeah. the throw and just yeah. do the throw and just go ah oh, this the the collar's in the wrong position mm -hmm. oh my foot's are in there oh didn't step correctly didn't yeah. turn my hips correctly yeah. or whatever and just the constant adjustment and and like improvement on the thing until it gets to a point yeah. where it's actually effective and working that's and being aware being aware being like Cause you can go, oh, it didn't work. I'll try again with no plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it didn't work. Like it's almost like the yeah. So it's you've got to go. Why didn't it work? How yeah. can I adjust? Self analysis. Yeah. And the the first positive feedback I got because it's like, look, to be honest, um, that first period I was accepting the fact that I would get with my size, I'm a smaller guy, that it'd be very painful and uncomfortable to, yeah. to start off with. But the first time I felt that there was a, a feeling of moving forward was after doing a first amount of like really drilling something over and over again, which yeah. was like, um, you know, Delaheva and X guard and switching between the two and then like triangles and yeah. arm bars off, off my back. And I yeah. found, cause my first few competitions I did were very humbling. Like I didn't know the competition mindset. I didn't, I didn't, um, like, I was listening to, like, J-pop and not stretching. And then, like, <laughs> Tim Searle, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And yeah. then, like, get, get mounted and armbarred straight away. I was yeah. like, all right, and that's not going to happen again. Mm. And then, yeah, developing some game at all. Like, yeah. all right, I'm going to get, I mean, I remember uh, Coach Tier was, um, you know, he would always say stick to you, play your game, be on, you know, get first, make do your game be yeah. on top. Yeah, for so, competition, yes. Yeah, for important. competition, for yeah. competition. So I felt like um, the first time I drilled something a lot and I felt like it was like uh, I could do it enough that I'm not thinking about it. Like yeah. it just comes naturally. Autonomous, yeah. um, and that was the first time I think in competition as a white belt, I actually would win a couple of matches in a row and um, would actually, yeah, I, I, it was applicable in a scenario where the person's, I don't know the person and they're really trying to yeah. win. And that was the first like major joy I felt from it where I was like, oh, like the, the works. I mean, it's on a slow look. It's a white belt comp, but you've got your goalpost low at that point. And I thought, you, oh, this is actually say that that's like a similar parallel with, with like the performance stuff of music. Like yeah. where you, when you go and do a performance, you're not going to play like some random song you don't know. You're going to play something yeah. that you all have rehearsed and done yeah. and whatever. Yeah. 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 And when it counts, when the adrenaline, like adrenaline control, yeah. um, when it counts, it's, it's, it's kind of like you don't get to be in the mood or anything. It's like it's go time now. You got yeah. to perform. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I love. I love the, that. How about like just being in a position where lots of people are looking at you and watching you? Like that was never something that was like causing a lot of anxiety. That because you've done it before, or is it still just like a lot? A lot mm. of the time, anxiety comes from just the fact that you're doing something that's important to you. I yeah. Mean, and of course, you're yeah. going to get better at dealing with it, but it's never going to disappear, and you have to kind of make peace with the fact that that's going to be a, an emotional experience you're going to have. But like a lot of people that like I've talked to before that like in small settings where they used to fight MMA and do all this stuff. So when they go and compete in a jiu-jitsu competition, they're not stressed. Totally. At all, you know what I mean? So do you think that might've helped at any time at all? Or not? Oh, absolutely. And it was always a battle with myself. And it sounds like a major cliche, but yeah. I was always, if I did badly, it's because I'd already lost before I'd even started. I'm yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it's okay. If, they so get me or whatever, yeah. yeah, or like oh, I won my first match. Um, it doesn't matter if it I doesn't if I, I, silver's okay, and then and then you go no, like try your hardest to win the goal. What are you I doing? Know, but like the, the, a lot of people talk about this, particularly like um, high level athletes like Charles Sun and stuff like that. Um, the easiest pathway is to accept failure, man. It's the most yeah. it's the most readily available way of moving. Oh, I'm too tired. I'm just going to stay in bed. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I, I'm going to get second place. Yeah, the mind oh, is always gonna... playing with you. Man, yeah. the, the, but the, the, mi the mind is always pushing you to the safest option, which a lot of the yeah. time for most things is man, failure. You're going to fail. Comfort the comfort, the, the failure. And the thing is, is, it's not that it's wrong. 
It's not that it's wrong because, yeah, like if you step on that ledge and you're on the edge of a building, yeah, you might fall off and die. It's there for a reason. Mm. But in a lot of situations like, you know, jiu-jitsu, like, blah, 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 and, and we, most of us live in very, very comfortable lives now. We don't have real threat or real stress. We don't have real uncomfort. You now have to create your own discomfort. Mm-hmm. All right? and, and all these little things are going to cause a completely different amount of discomfort in your body because we're just not exposed to anything that causes that yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to really fight that urge not to just accept the failure or accept the comfort because yeah. if you do, man, you end up, you know, in a pretty boring, bland place that doesn't really provide a lot or it's not really a fulfilling kind of way to live, you know what I mean? So, Totally. Um, a lot of, particularly, I actually used to perform solo, um, yeah. doing electronic music, like, um, not DJing, but like beats yeah. and like I had synthesizers and like, um, drum machine, you know, like pads yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. And like I did, I was, uh, like a tour of uh, support for a bunch of like national, like uh, international guys coming, like do like an East coast tour and stuff. Yeah. And I, all the concerts and gigs that meant something to me, I remember beforehand you go, why am I doing this to myself? This is so, I, I feel so uncomfortable yeah. and so terrified. Yeah. And um, like, why did I choose to make myself feel this way? And then like the gig goes really well. Yeah. And then you go, what was I worried about? That mm. was the best feeling in the world. The feeling so, afterwards is just rewarding, isn't it? Yeah, and that adrenaline dump. And, and I'm sure you guys could, I'm sure you've had times when you're competing and like, I'm choosing to be here. Like this yeah, is yeah. this is intense. Like this was my choice. Yeah. I think one one thing that was really de- I was a soccer player mm-hmm. my entire la- life when I was in Brazil, and one thing that was really different after I got to jujitsu, and I went in my first competition was like, because because soccer is a team. If you're not very good on that day, the team might you know play better f- for you. So you on the field, but you don't necessarily need to be the best player. Right, they can so carry team, you if you're having a bad day. Yeah. Sure. I think the the rugby can be the same thing. Yeah, yeah. any any team sports like that. And right? um, yeah. playing music, I think it's the same. Some days you might yeah. not be the best, but yeah. you have someone to support you. you know? Sure, sure. And jiu jitsu is different. If you're n- not good, yeah. then you're gonna get smashed. You know. It's Boy. yeah, it's it's totally different. Yeah, there's nowhere to hide in any in any like individual pursuit, whether it's tennis, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's yeah. dance performance, so any anything you do solo, you, do, you you cannot place ownership on anybody else. Mm. You have to accept full accountability for everything that happens. And like the yeah. the uh, the failure you take on, but you also take on the success. Like yeah. I did that. Yeah. 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 And it's a. Massive highs and massive yeah. lows with all that kind of thing. I think that's why people do crazy stuff like fight MMA or Muay Thai yeah. or whatever. Like the, the the stress and the discomfort and the training and everything all accumulates to like one event, right? And the release of like all of those hard years or hard mm. months or hard weeks of training mm. all comes into this one moment. And the, the lows are massive. The lows are so low, but the highs are so high, and that's it's that's the addiction, that's the adrenaline, yeah. that's the yeah. enjoyment, that's this thing that keeps you alive. And some people do it jumping out of airplanes, and some people do it, you know, picking up chicks, and some people do it opening new businesses. And yeah, stuff, you yeah. Know, and some people do it gambling. It doesn't matter how you do yeah. it. It's just it, it, it's the it, it experience of emotion and and you know life ups and downs. Ups and downs are life. That's what makes. The, the, the things that taste so good taste so good because you've experienced the things that taste yeah, bad. Yeah. You've eaten two-minute noodles with some tuna and now you can go and eat a Wagyu steak at a nice Japanese restaurant or whatever. There has to be bad things right, uh, to, for, the, for good things to exist yeah. and for them yeah. to feel the way they feel. Otherwise, everything will be the same. There's no reason for anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm, I'm very thankful for, I don't know, yeah, learning that those kind of values through certain yeah. things I've done in my life and realizing that because yeah, you worry about certain young kids you meet who are like, they've never, they just want the, the good thing now without putting the, putting the work in. And I, I am sounding my age now that I am slightly, slightly older than, than, um, you know, some people I train with or I meet and I'm realizing I am a different generation now yeah. slightly. Um, it's so like, you know, these kids today, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah. but it's so true. Like, Nothing just happened. Like 
you've got to fit, you've got to put yourself out there, comfort zone, all that kind of stuff. And starting Jiu Jitsu was one of those things. I was like, I'm gonna be. This is gonna be right, really out of my comfort zone. But before you know it, you know, you have little mini successes, and it's all relative. I've, I'm very self aware of how I fit into to everything, and I'm aware of my abilities. But I I, I love doing it, and um, this you know, this certain things that I, I you know. I want to want to get better at, and yeah. it's taught me a lot of stuff. That's all I'm trying to say, and um, yeah. it, it's it's been a great um, compliment to certain things I've done, say music and stuff yeah. like that. It's like this is another thing. Oh, like I'll do this forever. I love doing it. How, do you think that like all the stuff you've learned doing jujitsu has improved the music aspect of things as well, or not really? Um, I don't know about music. Just gen generally in in life, like yeah. I uh, adrenaline control and decision making. Um, not being too rash in, in my decisions. I used to be a bit of a short fuse. Like I used to be um, very emotional and, yeah. you know, like... Well, I think we all are. Human beings are like that. And I think like we, we've lost like a lot of teaching that used to occur. Like, you know, we used to live in villages and, and everyone would help shape you as a type yeah, of person. Yeah, the village like, raises a child. Yeah, correct stuff. type yeah. of idea. That, and that's completely disappeared. So, and, and, the, and the thing also is, is like the people that actually, you know, birth you, mother you, father you, whatever, they, they have to work so hard to just provide, you know, any type of provisioning and money and whatever and food and everything for you that they don't have enough time to spend with you and actually teach you the things that, you know, maybe six, seven generations ago that their yeah. parents were te- like their grand, 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 grandparents were teaching their kids. And, and I think like, it, it, and, and it comes down to like the, the type of lifestyle and all these things like, man, you learn through the ups and downs of life. Yeah. And, I think jiu-jitsu, what that does is reintroduce those ups and downs back into life yeah. that aren't really here anymore, and in, in, particularly in first world Western countries. Totally. It just doesn't exist. So anybody that does jiu-jitsu, they always have like all these different like personal benefits about how they've evolved as a human being and stuff like that. Man, even just, <clears throat> I hate to use the word mindf- mindfulness, but the presence of like you're only as good as, sh- your, your last role was last time. Like yeah. this is now. Today, like, yeah. So I'm... You, you, can't at, think about last week. Any time you slightly um, drift off path of reality, mm. it brings you back in like straight away. Do, um, do you have any advice for people starting out like jujitsu? Because like like you said before, it is a stressful situation, and it, it, initially it's so foreign and so mm. weird. And like we've talked with other people, had said the same thing. Like they drove past. Oh, it's a bit dark. No, I'm not going. <laughs> they yeah, go yeah. back home. We'll turn the TV on. Whatever. <laughs> And then, like, eventually... I was like, phew. Yeah, I don't want to go there again. But eventually, they work up the courage or whatever and yeah. go there. But, like, do you have any, um, like, advice for them to, like, start or if they're thinking about starting or, like... Um, absolutely. I mean... How were you able to work up to the point to actually go there the time you did? Well, the th- there's that, that saying, you know, the thing to it is to do it. Yeah. Um, you have to pull the trigger on it, yeah. And I admittedly... I feel like I did all, I made all the mistakes and I was that guy in many different times. Like I, so it's, you can't say don't, don't uh, like, yeah. cause I loved, cause I was very scrappy. Like I, I loved the physical side of it and I actually enjoyed, I'm a bit of a masochist. I enjoyed <laughs> getting Get destroyed up. and I'd go, whoa, <laughs> that was interesting. Like maybe I can do that one day. Yeah. Or like I was telling Ed, like did an open mat and it was, um, you know, like a lot of big guys. I mean, I won't mention the names because it for a wider audience. But some guy, you know, it was like um, good guys, and yeah. you know, just I was the only um, white belt at the open mat, and it was like four of us, and it was we just did like king in the middle or whatever mm-hmm. it is, and um, just got smashed and smashed and smashed. But look, sorry to answer your question. Um, like after that, I was like, do I give up now and feel like <laughs> and forever just be that guy who got smashed and then left? <laughs> Or and stuff like that, you know yeah. what I mean, um, is important to, like, you're going to have days like that. Yeah. Sorry, to answer your question properly, um, it's listening to listening to the people who know what they're doing. Okay. And I, now, I've, now that I've started helping, yeah. assisting you guys in coaching, I've realised that a lot more because some of the movements are unnatural. And, you know, there's that thing of like, oh, that feels weird. I, if I do that, I'm going to hurt my back or, like, you know, like... F- Falling backwards and breaking your hips to the side. I'm not falling, but you know, like 
there are certain movements that we normally don't do that yeah, are like okay. that are like jujitsu movements. Yeah. And the other people are like, but that's impossible or I can't do that. It's like just listen to the people who clearly have done it before. Have done it. Yeah. They're not gonna tell you something that like as a joke, yeah, do that and then like you yeah, just jump on your head like yeah. ha ha, you did it. Like yeah. it's when we're, we're not it's yeah. there's a reason for the movement. So I don't know, like focus on the on on the reason why be coachable be coachable and then be proactive i found going to open mats really valuable yeah just train and like but but when you when you're doing it be uh deliberate in what you're training like um be present when you're actually yeah you be present and go um because i I used to love scrambles but then there was a point where it was like it's not that it was just silly it was just like um you're not really being in a washing machine. It was like, yeah. ooh, it was like rolling around. It's fun. It feels and, fun until yeah. the point where I was like, okay, if I'm going to get in a scramble, what's my destination I want to end up in and what am I going to do straight away? Mm. So I don't know, be deliberate um, in what you're doing and yeah, be coachable and be, and try and be inconsistent as possible. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be painful physically and emotionally. <laughs> There's <laughs> no know. other way. But then, yeah, and that, but like we're saying, that's that's you, part of it. Now that you've like helped with coaching and you do some coaching and stuff like that with adults and kids and everything like that, do you think that's something that people struggle with is being coachable, or do you find that yeah. the majority of people are fairly coachable? Like, what do you think? The ones that I can tell are going to do well are coachable. Yeah, and you can tell that they're doing that move in the role and, and and trying and attempting and yeah. and getting tapped because they're they're trying it and they don't know it yet, but they don't mind getting tapped because they're like, oh well. It's okay. I wasn't trying to not lose. I was trying to this try is that something, position. This is definitely something that we've talked about before. Like, uh, I think we had Brendan on, on one of the episodes. It might have been episode 13 or something like that where we talked about it. But one of the one of the major things that, like, we talked about that was so important to develop doing jiu-jitsu was that, that um, relationship with failure. Like, we talked yeah. about. Yeah. We're talking a little bit about now. Like, the students that you can notice that are going to do well are super coachable, they listen, they mm. attempt, they try, they do all this stuff, but they put themselves in position to fail yeah. right, in an attempt to achieve their goal. And the thing is, is like failure is a normal part of the process in learning and, and improving and getting better. And I think one of the biggest things is most of the times it's not even that they're not coachable. It's just that they don't want to look as if even even in yeah. in the area of being coached, like they don't want to they don't want to admit that they don't know something because they don't yeah. want to look bad, and it all comes from like a place of fear. Yeah. And the thing is, is like the way you're gonna be perceived. The the, the perception of someone else. Oh, I don't want that to. And it's a fear of being perceived poorly, or it's a fear of being beaten by that person, or it's a fear of your girlfriend seeing you get submitted by some yeah. other dude, or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, but the thing imagine. is, is like, unfortunately. The only way to get good at this is to put yourself out on that ledge, to take yeah. the leap of faith, so to speak, yes. and attempt the thing and do the thing and be coachable and ask questions and blah, blah, blah. And if you do that well enough, you're going to improve consistently. Yeah, and I think that's a super important thing to kind of note because me being a coach, Luke's also a coach as well. Is that something that you would agree with or like I what do you notice with people being coachable and stuff like that? I f- uh, my perspective it's more like the more i know and i understand about jiu jitsu the the more i feel like i i need to learn more deeply of things you know yeah the more you realize and there is yes there's there, always yeah. uh, areas you can improve in jiu jitsu you know mm-hmm. but i think it, what you were saying about especially i realized uh with with the white belts the this perspective of winning and losing really frustrates people mm. and that's um wrong way people used to come here and try to win training mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. but if if you keep training there for five six seven years and you keep trying to come to training and win training that's gonna be very hard to improve your game you know that's that's something i really agree what you said yeah, um, it's like a paradoxical thing because, like, the more you only focus on winning, the more you lose. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because you you don't get better, you don't improve, you don't add skills, mm-hmm. you don't add understanding. You're not open to receiving information. Yeah. But the more you allow failure, and the more you use that failure as a tool to 
adjust and analyze uh-huh. and, and improve and fix things and stuff like that, the, the more you end up winning. And it's like a byproduct of taking the correct path. And, and again, there's no correct path, but it seems to be after talking with, you know, 20 different people or uh, 19 different people on the podcast and all the different people we talk with about jujitsu, it's like, it seems to be the people that, you know, are coachable, that are looking for information, yeah. that are passionately, and, and they're not asking questions to just ask questions. They're not asking questions to show how much they know or understand or mentioning techniques rather than they're truly like, look, I don't understand this thing. What can I do here? Like they're, yeah, they're yeah. passionately looking for an answer to a problem that they have. And I'm, I mean, we could talk underwater about that if yeah. the right person asks. I'm yeah. like, well, I'm glad you asked because yeah. I like talking about these things too. Mm-hmm. Or And I also don't claim to know. Like I feel like I know, uh, at a level where I know more than I used to, but I only feel like I want to speak on something that I yeah, feel like I understand. understand. Uh, and if I don't understand it, you go, well, I'm, I'm actually – I'm sure. wondering that Ice myself. Person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go talk to someone. Mm. And through that, the three of us have all learned, you know, mm. have learned something. But um, no, you're right. Um, there's been some interest. Yeah. Co- coaching, uh, being introduced to assistant coaching has opened my eyes massively to all that. And I've recognized that I've been a bad student at times and been aware of that now you know um it changes your perspective a little bit yeah. what, what what would you say is like being a bad student though that because this is a common thing that you know mm. most of us have probably done at some point well look i went through waves like there was a time where i was like s- drilling drilling and i i, I um was accepting failing a lot and yeah. like oh, it's okay i got passed because i'm working on this thing and, okay. I, I, got, and yeah. I and that was actually at white belt yeah. there were times i was better at white belt at certain things and then at Blue Belt, I think there are times where I, depending on what's going on in your life, some nights you just, you just want to you just want to fight, like you just want to train. <laughs> I'll, I'll be true. completely honest, like. Yeah, but man, everyone expresses that we're emotional. It's never going to be perfect all the yeah. time, but you know what I mean. Like if you look at the big picture of stuff, you've always improved. You've always gotten better. You've had this attitude of analysis and improvement. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, and then but the thing is, those moments where you're feeling where I was negative or had a bad attitude were short lived because because yeah. then it, it, you get hump. It doesn't work. It's not positive. It's something like negative doesn't have longevity. So then yeah. you go, all right, I got to I got to reevaluate. What was I doing that was working? And I go back to that. Yeah. Um, so and um, everybody and everybody's experience is different because like if you're a 120 kilo guy, you're not going to have the same negative feedback of just making force and bashing people. Yeah. Because it works for you. Yeah, yeah. It well, works for you because you're you the. the you know, in the top 2% of size in the gym, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. there's nobody that can compete with you on that level. Mm-hmm. But if you add another 10 guys that are 120 kilos and, you know, some of them are really got, technical, are technical yeah. or they understand better, or they have, yeah. and now you start to realize and go, oh, shit. Yeah. What have I been doing for the last eight years? What have I been doing for the last five yeah. years? Nah, like, it- this, is a, this is a big trap that people fall into because the thing is, is again, that easiest path the path of the path of least resistance allows you to and i've talked about this before it's like relying on physical attributes just does not last forever Mm -hmm. and it it might last for 10 years if you're a huge guy or if you're really flexible if you're really fast that might last for 20 years who knows but yeah the thing that conquers everything is the understanding the knowledge the 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 awareness of how things actually operate and work and that's what you're looking to learn and it's just such a hard thing to like navigate you know what I mean? yeah but being looking at it from the outside and being subjective uh, sorry objective i don't know you know like yeah. seeing it for what it is yeah. and then um and being self yeah brutally self-aware and um and yeah that's the only way to to move forward and look yeah um, I think it was important to be foolish in my training at times because I go, well, that was yeah. silly, wasn't it? That's how you learn, exactly. Failure, yeah. Failure. Yeah. And see, this is like the same underlying thing we've been talking about. It's like that that um, ability to kind of just like give in to the fear of, or not give in, but just be aware of it and do it anyway, of whether you're going to look bad or whether you're going to, um, you know, get submitted and be physically uncomfortable mm. or, or lose or whatever. You, oh, your ego you got damaged. I lost. I'm, um, you know, whatever. Mm. The the ability to, to accept the fear of that and accept that as a as a 
byproduct or, or as a repercussion of improving. Like you have to use those opportunities to analyze, adjust, improve. When something doesn't go well, you look yeah. at it, all right, what can I do different? You improve it, you change, you adjust. And it's not massive adjustments. The, the thing is, is like, there's a lot of people that look at jujitsu in a really unusual way for me because we have so much more experience and understanding. It's like, oh, eventually I'm going to get good. Eventually I'm going to get good. No, no, no. You, you're looking at it wrong. Like the way you get good is by thousands and thousands and thousands of small adjustments happen over time with consistent adjustments over years and years of time. And you know what I mean? And it is those little things. Oh, you know, I was a bit too um, accepting of positions when I was yeah. a white belt. And I was a bit too, you know, I, I know these positions now as a blue belt oh, and at, at a purple belt it's this and as a brown belt yes, it's that and, yes. it's, and, and and these are all adjustments and it's in your character and it's in the technical portions of, you know, oh, my finger was wrong, how you yeah. doing with the guitar. Yeah, and, yeah, fully. And fully. sometimes it's only that small. It's the the, the millimetre of your knee in this angle yeah. of this angle or yeah. the millimetre of your hand on the collar here up towards yeah. the neck or down towards the shoulders. Like they actually change everything and the, the more aware you are and the more detailed and accurate you are with those details, the easier it becomes. Yeah. yeah, there was a real spectrum for myself that went all the way back and forth. It was like, um, okay, at the beginning I'm just scrapping and getting thrown around and it was mm -hmm. like f proper, it was pr not fighting, but you know yeah. what I mean? Like I was just like, yeah, let's go. And then it was like, I was a little bit too creative, I think. Yeah. I mean, and, and all <laughs> the like... Artist, the artist coming in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, and you know, I, yeah. getting great feedback from there, just being like, dude, too much too much art going on here. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I'm too, uh, you know, I'd be like, ooh. Yeah. Um, and then it was like um, accepting the sweep or something like that. And it was like, no, 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 fight, fight, fight. And then, it, you know, you're like, you know, get, the, get on top, get on top. And it was like... Um, I remember Ed said something. It was like it was it stuck with me. It was like uh, I think I accepted a sweep with a, a female. I think I was training with, and it was like it was like a bad habit to do that. And he said it was like nice guys with bad habits is not nice or something along the lines of. It was like it was like <laughs> great. Right, you were very not you were yeah. you were so nice, but you've just lost you lost the, the uh, two points scored yeah, on you. Yeah, what are you doing? And yeah. and I was like, okay, you don't. I mean, so fighting the sweep doesn't make me mean or no, no. it's like, no, no, I'm, and then I, then I got better at not being, not accepting the sweep. And I was that kind of thing. Then I think I went a bit, it was like, it was like, are oh, you giving up the top too much? And then I went a bit too like, I will cross face you so hard. Like, and I got too aggressive mm. and then it was like, that's, that's silly. Cause then I cross faced the wrong person and they do the, the, the close, they get the full connection. They know and how they to roll do you over and they roll me that. over. And then I'm like, well, that was silly. Mm. Like, I could usually hold that. So it's back and forth, back and forth. I'm even noticing now my part of the journey. Um, I, w I wasn't aggressive. And, like I wasn't aggressive enough um, and that's fine until I go with uh, a really good black belt and it's like, dude, you were tensing the whole time when you trained. Yeah. And it's like, it's like your moves are good but you're, you're ruining all your flow and it's like too flowy to then too yeah. too tense. So balance net, balance is almost balance, impossible. Yeah. Like so finding this, the middle ground of things yeah. is so so different. And this is a monthly yeah. basis of yeah. like, oh, this is my month where I was a psycho, or then I was too relaxed, and then I feel like now my top game's getting better. But I'm trying to do it more technical without just being rude on top. You know, yeah, my, so my perspective it's kind of opposite. So you said a bit of the artistic part for me as. I started competing really early in jiu-jitsu. Um, I got this. Uh, oh, I can I can say that's a bad was a bad habit because I was always fighting for points in jiu-jitsu. Right. Because that that's the way IBJJF sure yeah. turns us. And my, and most gyms probably teach that that idea of jiu-jitsu. Like the self defense portion of jiu-jitsu is probably one of the like the smallest portions they teach for. Jiu Jitsu, it's all focused more on the sports Jiu Jitsu yeah, aspect but than points. There, there was there was not really helpful for my improvement in other areas because I remember when I was a blue belt, I was a blue belt for five years. Yeah, so I, mean, I was a blue belt for four or five years. Too, yeah, so know. I got I got stuck in my A game. I was doing deep half. Deep leg, half, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweep, yeah. Over under, pass from there. I was really good at that, but didn't have other you areas. know areas. Yeah. So I had to open my game and 
I realized, well, I have to do better in other games, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have to open, you have to accept that yeah. people pass your guard when yes. you do the La Riva because you're learning. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So I had to, I think the attitude is really important because I, I had to, to change my attitude towards the way I was training, you know? It's not, um, you, sometimes you have to put your best game towards training, but that's yeah. not, not all the times. So you have time. to try to improve, yeah. Yeah. you know, all their areas as well. You know? That seems to be a common thing for anyone yeah. who's getting success out of it. In success meaning, oh, I'm, I'm like moving forward and... Yeah. and uh, Evolving, improving, and, getting better. And there's not that like plateau that's like, and that happens. I'm sure there are people who quit because of that. A hundred percent. There's, but the thing is, is like, there's no reason to quit anything really. It's just yeah. like you're given another opportunity to either adjust, change something, improve a different way, focus on another situation or area of the same thing. But most of the time we're just so stubborn and like, no, I did my work and that's it. And it worked and I, I did it for a long time and it doesn't work. Nah, this is garbage. Because again, it saves, it saves you from the fear of, oh, I'm shit at this thing. Or it saves you from the fear of, looking bad because you've been training this way for 10 years but actually you should have been training like that or uh, even though i've done this for 10 years i need to get good at all these other things and like the thing is is like man you're always going to have those emotional experiences in life life is going to be disappointing you're going to be disappointing you're not perfect but we're brought up to believe that things should be perfect this fairy tale idea of of the world that we're taught through Disney movies and, mm. and the, the news and everything. It doesn't exist. Mm. It doesn't exist, man. Failure is a part of life. Being shit at things is a part of life. Life sucks. Life is sexist. Life is unfair. Life is horrible. You have to get good at things yeah. by putting yourself in bad situations that are uncomfortable, whatever. Do the, the adjustments, do the adjustments, yeah. do the adjustments, yeah. do the adjustments, do the repetition, do the repetition, do the repetition. And maybe, maybe if you do that for long enough, you will get good at something. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you bring things down to the nuts and bolts and the bare, the bare metal, it, it's unflattering for people. But life's unflattering. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. Life's unflattering. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We, we all, we're not all supermodels and we look like that on Instagram, whatever. And I bet even those people that are like that, when they go and look at themselves in the mirror after a shower, oh, they man. probably find things that they're unhappy with. Life yeah. is unflattering yeah. and it always will be. So deal with it. Learn how to deal with it and move forward. You, you know noticed I mean? how the hardworking parts in movies are in a montage and they're quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like... Yeah, yeah. No one, no it's one, like one million and two. No, no, like, one, that that part's not interesting for people. But it has to be done over a short period of time, yeah. over over half a song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, dude, that's like a year. Yeah, that's a year of work <laughs> right there. But because it's not, it's not interesting. People yeah. like the 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 awesome, the fun things, yeah. or the horrible things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the extremes. But most of the time, you operate in the middle, and the op and operating in the middle is actually what you're fighting for that balance. But it's boring. Yeah. But it's boring. Ninety yeah. percent of the shit you do yeah. is boring as shit. It's it's just yeah. boring. It's oh yeah. It's just going there and doing the same thing for a year, for two yeah. years, for three years, for four years, for five years, and eventually, once you've done that for long enough, for five years, and all the boring stuff of, oh, you know, I was too aggressive this month, or this month I was yeah. too slow and yeah. I wasn't really active or I wasn't present enough or whatever. And once you analyze those things and adjust them over five years, which is boring as hell. Yeah, it's boring. Mm. What's good like? It's small adjustments over years of time. Yes, it's boring. Mm. It is boring. And it's but painful. But that's growing. It is painful and boring. But that's the growing and part. And it's funny. It's funny because I, I don't like journaling. Like I, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I find I don't have a, not a discipline, but I don't naturally go back to read things I've written or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. So it all happens in my head when I'm like driving and that's, and that's painful because it's... For sure, yeah. Because, but you try, I try and get in that habit of like, why why was that why was that what can i do what can i do to to make that better having off a time all right yeah we're going pretty good we, we'll, we'll call it quits pretty soon but um i just want to ask one question because i like i used to work security and stuff like that before and i actually saw you at, 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 a, at a few venues him playing like oh uh, really uh like some bands and stuff yeah. like that and everything um like obviously you know this is you even said before like your mum picking you up and people smashing on the window and stuff like that like it, it's a fairly Man. intense situation anytime you add alcohol and there's people going crazy and stuff like that have you ever had any like altercation type experiences like doing the nightlife and playing oh, and yeah. stuff 
Yes. And and like, is that is that like, can you walk us through any of those things or like the aggression of that? Or yeah, whatever? yeah. Well, it's awful. And and did it happen before or after jujitsu or, or both or both? Yeah, both. Um, oh, look, I've seen because I played a lot of weddings as well. Yeah. I've seen one side of the family like two different like the in-laws hating each other and punching on the in the wow. car park crazy like one side of the family all had oakleys on their head yeah like 17 dudes had the same sunnies on their yeah. head that's one family yeah. and the other family's like got their nose up at them and yeah. you get bundaberg rum involved um oh yeah like from i don't know seeing incredibly violent situations go down in in clubs to um trying to bump out equipment like carrying a 40 kilogram amp with someone and then try having to go through a dance floor and people like like wet willing you in the in the ear or like or it's like smacking you in the face as you people. go or being like well the only choice is we just barge through and we go are you ready yeah and then just smash the equipment through and then the, you like part the <laughs> sea of people yeah yeah like stuff You're like doing that. A snowplow, people. Yeah, which is risky because yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, just the ugly side of. I, I actually, not that COVID got me out of it, but I I enjoyed stepping away from club life because yeah. it was like work all week, we train a lot here, and then it's like okay, the bump in's nine thirty at night, and you go okay, and then when's what's the gig? Oh, ten till two, and then you go all right. So the two's when we stop playing. Yeah. Then I'm, gotta then I go bump up. out, yeah. and then you got to drive, yeah. and then you got to go home and have a shower. So I'm like in bed at like four, yeah. and then you get Sunday to recover. So I don't know, I don't miss that stuff, but um, yeah, yeah, just violence. Have, de- you, ever, have you ever had to protect yourself though? Like, okay, sorry. Um, no, I've been pretty good at staying out of trouble. Um, I've, I've had people around me who have um gotten into trouble, and it's always because of something they've said. Yeah. Um, no. I, I've always stayed out of that kind of thing, to be honest with you. Um, I was... Do, 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 do you think, like, like understanding and knowing jiu-jitsu versus when you didn't change how you feel in those situations? Yes. I, look, I, I feel a lot more confident in the sense of... Um, uh, like, I've been punched in the head and stuff, but it's like... it's um, I haven't properly sparred stand-up. Yeah. But I know that if I was to fall down and someone was to fall on top of me, I know that I would have a pretty good technical stand-up and I'd know that I'd be able to at least get some area, uh, like some space to, to kind of maybe free myself and run. Um, yeah. But I do feel more confident. The last thing I want to do is, 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 um, is grapple with someone for real in a fight because I just don't feel like that's going to be good for anybody. no. Like, I don't know, but I feel confident in knowing I would probably, unless it was five guys or three, yeah. at least two, I'd like kick one in the nuts and then, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't yeah. know. But I'd feel like I would. Do some Wing Chun on there. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know some, what I mean? Do some Aikido. <laughs> I even uh-huh. feel like for, the, for a certain period, unless it was really unfair in their weapons, I feel like I'd have some kind of uh, ch- better chance than someone who didn't train Jiu Jitsu of yeah. like, of like distance and, and, yeah, getting, and getting, up, up, getting away, getting surviving, up. surviving. I feel like if I was being headlocked, I'd probably know how to work that out a little bit. Mm. Um, especially when the adrenaline's uh, there, because I feel like, oh no, we like, yeah, we, 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 we're we spar. In, the gym, we're in sports, stuff. sports jujitsu is different to street fighting. <clears throat> street fighting. Yeah, yeah, you you just, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like, I think that's something that's definitely disappeared and, and stuff from a lot of most jujitsu instruction not all some guys are still you know rio hero style kind of like smashing each other's faces in and stuff and, and teaching how to protect each other but it's kind of disappeared a little bit and you know i, I don't think it's ne- it's particularly a bad thing um because you know society is getting you know more or less violent i don't know i don't know if that's really true is it can you can you notice a difference like so you've been working in clubs and doing all this stuff for a long period of time have you noticed a change of violence over over that period of time do you think it's improved or gotten worse or i think it's always been there um hasn't changed much at all it's just human nature i think i think um mid to like early two like late noughts was very violent i found when i was going out when i was early clubbing i saw some awful stuff i think it's always been there um I think maybe 
people who, are, who don't have have never fought are pretty keen to know what it's like, and that's a bit silly to do that when you're out clubbing. Like, right. someone's like, I just really want to know what it's like to throw a punch at someone, and that's so silly to do that. <laughs> Go to a boxing gym. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what I mean. It's like, um, and yeah, I think clearly quite quickly they regret going into that, and because mm. it's. It's, it's it's ugly and it's it's awful. Yeah, it's not flattering. Yeah, no, and the you'll probably lose. The realities of most things in life are not flattering yeah. and not enjoyable yeah. and not comfortable. Life's pretty fucking horrible, man. For most most yeah. situations, like obviously there's the the really low low parts and the really really high high parts. But man, in the middle ground, it's like pretty unflattering. It's not amazing. It's not great. Mm. It's not. It's life. Life is life, man. Yeah. And yeah, like I said before, man, this like fairy tale thing that ever people are sold all the time of. Man, even about martial arts of how you can defend against 10 guys yeah. and use a chi blast and yeah. spin around with this and bang and like, da-da-da. Man, this is all garbage. Like, mm. the realities of self-defense, the realities of street fighting, the realities of um, doing martial arts, the realities of life itself and becoming a better person are not so flattering and enjoyable and lovely. They're pretty boring. It's just hard work. And the thing is, is like, the more you get into that idea or that frame of mind and understand that life is hard work and you're going to have good times, you're going to have bad times, but most of the time just working hard and yeah. improving as a person. You have this middle ground where you're comfortable and, and happy, but it's not good or bad and it's just trucking on. Like, man, the, the more you're going to get out of life. It's not about... I, I, I just think we've been like, particularly people in first world countries have just been brainwashed to understand a completely indulgent, hedonistic version of life yes. it's not real man it's yes. not sustainable that's why there's so many people with you know um heart disease or or, di or or diabetes or obesity or like man you have all these conditions because you've been brainwashed to think that life is about indulging and that's all it's for it's not for that at all it, actually look at all the negative effects of that you know yeah I mean? yeah everyone's just um Eating food that's made from seed oils and getting inflamed and yeah, but no, but in, but, in, but in every aspect, it's, it's, uh, just sleep with anybody, do this, do oh, that. I see what you see. Like, yeah, it, yeah. It's just it, it feels good. It, yeah, correct. And, and that's what. We, I, and I've talked about this like maybe like every single freaking um, podcast. But like society has been pushed from a thing to like understand how life works and then make the decisions you want to do whatever feels good and. For me, I think that's an insane way of living and that's kind of like the normality now. You know, you, you put your feelings above anything and everything. You, you you can't be bothered anymore in a marriage, leave and find somewhere yeah, yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't be bothered. You had a hard year. You had a hard year, yeah. get out. You had a, you, yeah. um, this is hard, do something else. Mm -hmm. You can't get a jiu-jitsu belt, go to another gym. Oh, you, totally. You, you can't improve in jiu-jitsu, do another martial it art. It can't like, be me, it's got to be somebody yeah, else. Yeah. I find an interesting analogy is... Um, is like peeing yourself, right? Yeah. You go, peeing yourself actually feels good because you need to pee, you need to pee. Yeah, yeah. And then it's warm. Yeah, yeah. And then you go, all right. And then, like five minutes pass, yeah. and it gets cold, and you go, oh, I got to change my and pants. And the humiliation of the stench <laughs> of urine. So my body. point being, my point being is like, you shouldn't pee. Like it feels good, and it's yeah. like, but it's bad for you. Like yeah. don't. That's you know what I'm. I don't know. It's like why. Why do it? You know what I mean? We all know not to do it, but I know, people but it, do it. It's a good analogy because like putting the putting the way you feel, <laughs> it, but it's what it is. It's like... It feels good right now. It does, it does feel good right now. But, that, man, but that, man, you can compare that to so many different situations. Why do you think so many girls get on OnlyFans or, uh, or create a, like a, a body selling business or become an escort or whatever? Like, mm. man, it's good now. The money you're making is great now and it's going to last for two, three years or maybe five or whatever. But about 10 the, years the, later. 10 years later where you can't find a husband, man. nobody wants to marry, yeah. blah, 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 all these things like... People, this is what I'm talking about. People don't understand the repercussions of what they're yeah. doing because you've been brainwashed as a society to put that stuff first. No, but the way I feel is more important than the realities yeah. of the world. Uh, they don't well, think about I'm, consequences, right? Yeah, because you've, you've been taught not to. You've been taught, no, focus on how you feel. Focus on how everything feels yes. for you. Yeah. Man, that's a crazy way to live. Yeah. And you, all the outcomes you have in life. And this is the thing where they get where people become very bitter and jaded and horrible later in life is because reality hits them in the face. And just like you're saying, the stench of urine hits you in the yeah, face. Yeah, it's cold and now. And you have to go, oh, what the hell? Like reality <laughs> hits you in the face. And it might be 10 years, it might be five yeah. years, it might be 20 years. But reality at one point in time is going to hit you in the face. And then you're going to turn around and be angry with the world because you know what? 
They lied to you. Yeah. They lied to you yeah. and where, where, where the world lied to you. And unfortunately, that's what happens. And the thing is also is why do they do that? Because, man, when you lie, people buy, dude. When you lie, people buy. You tell someone that it takes three weeks to get a six-pack, they're going to buy that thing. Yeah. You tell them that uh, there's an online marketing course that's going to make their business make a million dollars a year, they're going to buy that because people want what you're selling. But the thing is, is what you're selling is not real. And this is a problem, and it's a problem in jiu-jitsu, and it's a problem everywhere. Look, my, my perception in between the first world country living in Australia yeah. and the third world country living in Brazil, it is, for example, yeah. in the nightclub, I see a lot of people being douchebags, like... <laughs> They act in, in like here? yeah in, in here yeah, in okay. Australia in, in first world and they they don't fear fighting here because they're not afraid to die. In Brazil, people yeah. are afraid to die. They're gonna get killed so, so the, if you mess with the wrong person. They're gonna kill so you. So there's less less bravado in Brazil because it's like if because there's real repercussions. So more more barking because yeah. because, because we don't know what the bite's gonna be like. Whereas right. the consequences in Brazil, in Brazil like, you know, I don't want to get shot. You mess with the yeah. wrong person, yeah. they're gonna so kill you. This yeah, is a big difference between um like third world countries or non-western mm. countries and western countries because again you, you you there's no repercussions for what you do unless and this is the big unless unless you fight against the person in charge and who's the person in charge in first world countries big daddy government you want you want to do the wrong thing against the government you want to fight against them all right they'll will, they'll will lock you away and throw away the key they will they will fight you and you're never going to win in third world countries where they don't have the ability to impose in the same way, right? Because they just don't have the ability. There's other people that are in charge. And if you screw with those people, you have their repercussions. And it's a slightly different version of the same thing, but it's, I, I 100% agree. And it's a really interesting thing to kind of like talk about and, and think about like, they don't, they don't understand the repercussions of that because it doesn't exist here. It only exists when you fight against a particular situation which is big daddy government if you do that here oh yeah, yeah they will take your business away oh oh what did you do you did this oh that's interesting couple that's of years fraud. Forward, yeah. oh that's this that's that all right you're gonna go to prison you go there and say the wrong thing you go there and steal from somebody you steal money or whatever man you're gonna end up in the bottom of the river it's yeah it's a different situation slightly different outcomes they're still gonna ruin your life but yeah so that's interesting so when you started clubbing here compared to Back oh, in Brazil, yeah, you know, you noticed the douchery was totally. large. The level of arrogance and and just complete un, like the non understanding of the capability of violence and stuff. Yeah. And I would go as far as to like talk about that across genders and stuff too. Like, like people have have like man, th- th- this thing to do with emotions and stuff is really interesting to talk about. To do with like the differences in 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 like genders, I think, and I, I'm it's not going to be political or anything like that. You shouldn't teach boys or men to focus on their feelings. Why? Because the way men and boys ex- express their emotions is violent. It's aggressive. Yeah. When you allow a society to develop on that, all right, and you teach dudes that just express yourself how you want, they're going to be destructive. Whether if they're self-destructive or destructive to other people, it's not the right thing to do. And particularly in first world countries you allow um the same behavior from girls and and boys and women and men and whatever and now again this is like a police state you know a a safe country you allow women to treat men with complete disrespect in certain scenarios now i'm not saying that it's correct all right on either side but like people have lost the repercussions of things like man a hundred years ago man you did the wrong thing to this king, to this Viking, to whatever, whether you're male or female, you were met with repercussions. You were beheaded, you were murdered, you were blocked. Like people have lost repercussions yeah, for life. Yeah. Like the way people treat each other. And look, I, I think there's a, a different treatment towards men in most in, in most Western countries. They're looked at as evil for some reason, just for existing. And I'm mm. like, well, I don't get it. And it's presented in everything, but like, and, and look, you know, they've got privilege and they've got this. All right, look, there's been atrocities that have happened throughout the, the existence of human time. Humans are freaking horrible, man. They're horrible creatures. We're not perfect. We're not beautiful. We're capable of the most disgusting, most atrocious behavior on the planet. Mm. That's not the point. The point is, is like in most Western countries, right, men have lost the repercussion of violence from other men and, and women have kind of lost that 
kind of authority leadership type situation as well, which again, there's two ways that that can be implemented. Either people fear you through violence or people respect you through the way you carry yourself. And of course, you should never condone violence to any person or human being. But the thing is, is like the way people act and behave now in Western countries or this like entitled like douchebaggy, like you, I deserve what I deserve is, is, is from that situation. There is no repercussion for yeah. bad behavior anymore. Mm. You're not allowed to bring it up anymore. If you bring it up, you're, not, you, you're a yeah. terrible individual. You get yeah. canceled. You get canceled, canceled yeah. Now. now, I know this is like a super polemic topic, but we're kind of running out of time a little bit. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll focus on that one next time probably. Um, no, Tim, thanks so much for coming on. Like, And Lucas, thanks well, as well thanks, for yeah, filling in for Eduardo. Like, it, man, super, super interesting conversation. And it's always fun to talk to you and just, you know, this time just learn a little bit more about you and hear about everything. And yeah, man, it's it's interesting all about the music and everything and the and the whole music career. So thanks so much for coming along. It's a pleasure. And thank you guys. Thank it's it's um been interesting to be on this side of things. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, thanks for coming in yes. and I thank appreciate you guys. Thank you guys. Um because we don't um we're you know busy. We got a lot. Like it's it's good to have a uh, period of time to just to just chat. Yeah. And we we get our chats, but it's nice. It's hard to good. keep it in time, man. Start getting like <laughs> I want to talk another hour about you know. Oh man, and, uh, I yeah, feel like we're scratching the surface. I, I agree, man. It's just scratching the surface. We will have to do another episode one time. Man. Yeah, yeah. Well, whenever I'm around, I'm, I'll be yeah. here every week anyway. I'll just awesome. if it's you know. Get we want another, to talk about the minutia we'll get, we'll of the podcast. It, we'll, you know what I'm saying? We'll get another two chairs and everyone can sit in. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, everybody. We'll see. Thank you. We'll see.